All right. Um, we are in class five. Uh, the daily quiz for today is quiz number five. So I hope you go to Great Scope and answer that quiz. Uh, it is open until 11.59 p.m. tonight. Uh, the date today, Feb 9th, 2021. The homework that is due tonight is homework two. It's due on Great Scope uh, today, tonight. The next homework, I'll be posting this uh, later today. It will be due next Tuesday. Uh, the studio. So studio one, as you guys know, it is due uh, Feb 17th. Uh, so you still have uh, a bit of time, uh, just a, over a week to complete this. Uh, so you can use the studio time tomorrow to uh, continue working on studio one or some of you have already finished that so you can get started on studio two and you can also use this time to pair up if you don't have a partner already. Uh, I assume that uh, some of you might know someone from the class uh, so if, if that is the case and you guys want to partner up uh, you can do that. Uh, what I would say is pair up with someone who is in your section so that there are no uh, constraints in terms of time. So th then the teaching staff can expect both of you to be present during the TA checkoff process. And as I mentioned many times before, studios require two things. One is the TA checkoff and uh, a, a report that you would submit on grade scope. So for studio one, it's an individual report, individual checkoff, but from studio two onwards, uh, it'll be a, a group checkoff and a group submission on uh, grade scope. We require that both students be present while the checkoff is happening. So that if we, uh, if we uh, you know, the teaching staff is probably going to ask you a couple of questions to see uh, whether you understood things uh, the way we intended it uh, to be taken or not. Okay. so next talk about studio two so i've posted studio two on piazza under studio exercises um and that's when you're not you're you're, you're teaming up um and it's due uh after a week after studio one is due due so let me write that studio two due uh wednesday feb 24th so you have a bit of time to, to work uh, on the studios and I have kind of spread them uh, out so that, you know, some people might be working on Studio 1, some people might get started on Studio 2. All right, questions or concerns? Going once, going twice. All right, let us move on here. Now, uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about where we are at, right? So we have been talking about how do you uh, implement uh, logic functions? Well, you need some transistors to do that. What transistors are we using? We are using CMOS transistors, which allows us to occupy very, very small real estate on a PCB uh, on, on, in, inside a chip. So we are going to be using CMOS technology going over designing these logic gates. And the first logic gate that we talked about was the uh, inverter. Sorry, I didn't type fast enough. Um, hold up. For Studio 1, so there's a question in the chat box. Studio 1, for logic expressions, do we have to draw them? Or can we write? Um, you mean write the logic expressions, right? So uh, for that particular question, I expect uh, students to write a logic expression. So something like this. Uh, you would say y equals x and y, right? So that's a logic expression. You would write write, write it out. Uh, using using the AND operator here. Uh, what I don't want to see is you copy pasting your VHDL code as a logic expression, right? So logic expression, I'm, I'm looking for a logic expression that you would, you would write, um, you know, different from VHDL on a piece of paper. How do you write a logic expression? All right, so I hope that answers that question. Let's come to the inverter. So we, we said, all right, let's, let's try to um, design these uh, logic functions using transistors. 
And the way it worked out was that the for the CMOS NOT gate, we needed one NMOS transistor as our pull down network. And if we put a, a PMOS transistor, which is complementary to the uh, NMOS, we still have the three terminals in terms of source, drain and gate. By controlling the gate terminals of both these transistors, we can uh, implement a NOT gate. And we went through, uh, you know, talking about what is a pull up, pull down network, what is Q1, Q2 over here, what are what are the some of the, the physics uh, of the NMOS transistor and the PMOS transistor itself. Um, so let's continue with this discussion. Um, we looked at the switch model in both those situations when the input is low and when the input is high, you see that you, if you model each of those transistors as a switch for one of the conditions, Q1 is going to be open, Q2 is going to be closed, and you are going to get an output of high. And in the other case, uh, when input is high, Q1 is going to be closed, Q2 is going to be open, and B out is going to be low, right? So that's how you, you get your uh, switch model from the, um, uh, the NMOS and the PMOS, sorry, the pull down and the pull up network. Um, and you can write a table using that. We also talked about the, the motivation uh, to why we need a buffer at all, right? Like why do we not just use a wire to connect one logic gate to the other? Why do we need this buffer in the middle? And the reason for that was if some of the logic levels become weak, so for example, if you have a weak zero instead of a strong zero, or a weak one instead of a strong one, then you could use a buffer to so uh, regenerate that logic level so that when you give that to the next section, uh, of your logic diagram, it would be a solid logic level. And that way you kind of protect yourself from incorrectly uh, getting the wrong logic level. And the way you s implement a buffer is by simply taking one NOT gate and putting another NOT gate in front of it. So if a zero goes in, it becomes a one first and then it becomes a zero again, next, right? So whatever goes in, a zero, if it goes in, you get a zero out. However, the, 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 the feature that we are looking for is if a weak zero goes in, a strong zero comes out, which is very helpful in terms of cascading different sections. And, you know, if we look at this particular NOT gate and this particular NOT gate, we know that we used uh, an NMOS and a PMOS transistor for this guy and an NMOS and a PMOS transistor for this guy. So if you cascade them uh, the way it is shown over here, you get four transistors, but you will be able to uh, implement a buffer. Now, um, we took this to the NAND function, right? So for the NAND function, again, this is sort of uh, connecting a few concepts together. NAND and AND, these two logic functions require switches to be in series. And the switch functionality is provided by my NMOS transistor. The opposite of the switch functionality or, or, or the complementary function is provided by the PMOS transistor. So if I need switches in series, then I would put two NMOS transistors in my pull down network and my pull up network is simply going to be complementary. So two NMOS transistors in series. Over here, I've got two NMOS transistors in parallel. In fact, if you just want to look at one network, you could get derive the other network because it's given that it has to be complementary. Now, if, if you take this uh, CMOS NAND gate functions and try to build the AND functionality, how would you do it? Well, you would have to put a NOT gate in front of the NAND to get AND. Right, that, that's what we, we talked about last time. So we said, all right, how do you build this particular AND gate? Well, take a NAND, we know that it requires uh, four transistors. It also depends on the number of inputs, right? So if your number of inputs to this AND function are two, then you need four transistors in total, uh, two of them NMOS, two of them PMOS. Why is it different from uh, BJTs? Well, BJTs are uh, slower than MOSFETs. They are not as compact as MOSFETs so in terms of transitioning, right, you want this electronic switching to be very, very fast. So that's what the biggest motivation to in not use BJTs and instead use uh, MOS transistors. Uh, there are lots of other advantages as well. Uh, 
you, you can you can read about that but the main but the main one is the the speed of electronic switching that the mass transistors uh, give us because if you are trying to drive a high speed signal through these logic gates you want that to be re responding very very quickly all right uh, so how do you get this two input and uh, why can't you you can absolutely oh yeah absolutely you can you can make uh, uh, logic gates using uh, BJT transistors as well. There are other ways of designing logic gates. Uh, in fact, you can design a logic gate by just using NMOS transistors. You don't even need PMOS. Uh, you, uh, let, let's talk a little bit about that. So suppose I have, I want to design an inverter, right? So an inverter over here. So a NOT gate. How do I design that using one NMOS transistor? I simply need one NMOS transistor, my source terminal goes to ground, my drain terminal is where I am monitoring my output voltage, V out over here, but instead of a pull up network, what I can do is I can use a resistor to pull the voltage up to 5 volts. And again, I have my input over here, which is the gate terminal, which again connected to uh, V in, right? So this also gives me a not operation, right? So for example, if V in is low, what is going to happen to Q1? Well, if V in is low, Q1 is going to be open, which means V out is going to be high. It's being pulled up, but it is being pulled up through a pull up resistor. When V in, so V in was low, V out was high. When V in was high, the Q1 transistor is going to be closed and V out is going to be the same potential as ground. Right, so you're getting that inversion operation with just one NMOS transistor, but you need a pull-up resistor over here. So what is the problem with this? Well, this lean, uh, not really. It's a, it's a, it's a pretty actually it's a big disadvantage because if you have a resistor, it is absorbing power, right? So whenever you are uh, allowing current to pass through the resistor, it is going to be converting that into heat energy, dissipating power, consumes more power than what a PMOS transistor would, right? So for, for specifically for energy conservation, you would use a CMOS combination instead of just using an NMOS. So it's, it's power. So resistors absorb power. Don't like that. Let's save that uh, by using a PMOS transistor. Okay. Uh, da -da 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 Let's move on here. Oh, so uh, we said, all right, how do you get the AND? Put an AND followed by a NOT. The, the NOT function gets canceled with that bubble there, and then you get your AND function. So in other words, you would not be interested in, in terms of logic function, there is AND, NAND, and so on. But in terms of gates, if, if you look at it in terms of transistor level gates, then there is NAND, but to get AND function, you actually have to manipulate that, right? And, you know, also AND requires more transistors. As you can see, it requires uh, two more transistors because of the presence of that NOT gate compared to uh, NAND. So, based on this, I hope you guys uh, are looking for ways to use NAND fun NAND logic functions rather than AND logic functions because it saves you the transistors. If you save transistors, then you save power, real estate, uh, propagation delay, all of those aspects are better that way. All right, we'll talk more about the usage of just the NAND gates to uh, synthesize logic functions later on. Over here we have a switch model, right? This is for the uh, two input NAND. And it's talking about a few combinations here. So this is going to be your pull down network. Let me take blue here and say, all right, this is my pull down network and this is my pull up network. And it's the same for all the three uh, configurations over here. So when you have a pull down network with two switches in uh, in series over here, 
you right away can say that both the switches would have to be closed in order for your output Z to be able to go to low. Right. So the only way that happens is this last condition over here. Only when the two switches are closed, only then Z can go to low. Otherwise it cannot because if even one of them is open, you will not be able to connect to ground. And because over here things are in parallel, if this guy is closed, that means that is open. Right? It's corresponding complementary PMOS is going to be open. Right. So if, if this is closed, that is open. If this is open, that is closed. So it gives you a parallel path to be able to connect to high. So sometimes, you know, um, as you're getting uh, familiar with these uh, CMOS transistors, the, the switch model uh, should help you understand the background, the, 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 the connections, but you really don't want to draw the switch model every time, right? So you, you, want to, you want to be able to look at this and be able to say, all right, I need both of these two to be on in order for Z to be uh, going to low. All right, so um, let me work on uh, some, uh, all right, let's move on. Let's come back to that later. Now, if you want to design a NAND gate with three inputs, what would you have to do? Well, that is very simple. Add one more transistor in series in the pull down network, right? You're adding Q, Q5 over here in the pull down network. And because you added something in series in the pull down, you would add something in parallel in the pull up. And right away you can, you can see that, all right, I need Q1, Q3, Q5, all these three to be on in order for Z to go low. The only time that happens, as you can see through this table here, is the last column here. The only time that happens is when A is high, B is high, C is high, those are the three gate voltages, with respect to source of course, uh, that, that will make Q1 on, Q3 on, and Q5 on which means that their switch model would be closed, 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 allowing that Z to be, uh, uh, go to a low potential, right? So that's the only time that goes to low. As you can see, Q1 on, Q3 on, Q5 on, uh, and of course their complementary functions are going to be off here uh, Q for Q2, Q4, and Q6. Now, so that's your uh, three input NAND function and uh, it looks like it needs six transistors. So we can quickly ask this question, how many transistors are gonna be uh, required to synthesize uh, a three input AND function? So eight, right, brilliant. So all I need to do is do a six transistor implementation of NAND and then simply uh, add or cascade a NOT gate in front of it and a NOT gate is one NMOS and one PMOS, and right away I get eight. And you could also sketch this out pretty pretty easily, right? So all you would need to do is, uh, let me let me try to see if I have the inverter here sketched out. Uh, da, 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 I think I do, right? So I'm gonna grab this guy from here and copy it and bring it over here and paste it and then show you how this would look like, right? So if I paste it right there, you see, all of this will give me NAND. I've connected the output of the NAND into a NOT gate here, and the output over here, which is sort of the, the, the common drain for both the transistors there. That would be the output of the NAND, uh, of the AND function there, right? So let me just make that connection. That is to that. And then this is of course representing that. You can see that. So, and two more transistors than NAND. Buffer, more transistors than NOT, right? So NOT requires two, buffer requires four. Uh, so that gives you some idea about uh, the cost, the underlying cost for these logic functions. So right now I hope that there is motivation to look more into NAND, right? All right. So the story is going to kind of flip when we start looking at NOR. Now what is NOR? NOR is exactly the opposite of R, right? So R followed by a bubble or the inverter gives me uh, a, a NOR operation. 
So nor and or these are two functions that uh, that need what nor and or function they need switches in what. in parallel, right? So this or this, I need alternate paths. So if I have Q1 here, so that's with respect to what? The normal switch behavior, which means no voltage, keep it open. High voltage, keep it make it closed, right? So that's normal switch behavior, which translates well into what an NMOS transistor does. Low gate voltage, Q1 is open high gate voltage, Q1 is closed. And the same thing applies for Q3. So I've got two, um, let's try to identify my pull up and pull down network here. So in terms of pull down network, what do I have? I've got two transistors in parallel, two NMOS transistors in parallel. Pull down network equals two NMOS in parallel. And for the uh, P the pull up network things are going to be complementary. So hopefully this should be straightforward. I've got two uh, pull up network equals two PMOS transistors in series. Again, complementary, right? So if you know one, you know the other. Um, all right. So does this work? Let's try to find out. What does it need? Well, over here, the, the, the combination that you are going to try to look for is because Q2 and Q4 are in series, the only way Z can be pulled up to high is if Q2 is open, Q4 is, uh, sorry, Q2 is closed and Q4 is closed, right? That's the only way Z can go to high. Where is that? That's the first entry in the table right there. Only when Q2 is on and Q4 is on, Z can go to high. Otherwise, it will have to be staying low because there will be parallel paths connecting it to ground. All right. So what does it mean? Q2 has to be on. Q4 has to be on. What do I need to give? Well, it's a PMOS transistor. So if I give A as low and B as low, that will make sure that Q2 and Q4 are uh, on. They, in the switch model, they would be closed and there would be a connection from Z to high, right? So that's the only time, uh, that's the kind of the, un, the entry that you're looking for because everything else kind of uh, makes Z low. All right, so it looks like a two input NOR gate requires four transistors. So what do you guys think about a three input uh, a three input NOR. Well, that should be simple. You guys say six. All right, six CMOS, right? Six CMOS transistors. Uh, where would you add them? Well, I would add one more in parallel over here and I would add one more in series over there, right? So you're just making things a little bit bigger in terms of a circuit diagram, but the concept remains the same. Pull down network, parallel, and MOS transistors, pull up network PMOS transistors in series. That applies for NOR. Uh, and what would I need to do for R? Let us try to uh, uh, let us try to do that over here. What would I need to do for R? Well, to get R, not NOR. You got it. So R equals uh, NOR followed by NOT, right? So this is a NOR operator here, and then you follow that up with a NOT, you get your R operator. Double negation cancels out, which, which essentially means the way you would draw the uh, a circuit diagram for an R gate, let, let us just say we have three input OR gate. What would I need to do for that? Well, my OR means switches in parallel. All right, let me put three switches in parallel. One, two, and three. All of them, they are pulled down, connected to ground. 
Okay, I'm done with the pull down. What about the pull up? If I have three transistors in series, in the pull up, I'm going to have three transistors in parallel, but they are going to be PMOS. Uh, sorry, series and PMOS transistors. One, two, and three, and I'm done. Where is that going? Well, that needs to go to plus five or VDD. I have all the drains need to be connected to one point. Done that. Where is the output? Well, that is the output. So what am I connecting to the inputs here? If I connect A, B, C over there, that's what I'm doing here, right? I'm doing A, B, C over there. The same, the same three go here. I don't want to drop too many wires here, but that's your three input R. Well, at least I would hope that this is three input R, but it turns out you don't get R, you actually get NOR, which means that I need to cascade this with uh, a, a NOT operator, right? So this is what? This is uh, NOR, which means that you need to, right, that's NOR, you got it. So I need to put a NOT gate in front of it, so I need to do what? Uh, let's see, bring it out, split it into PMOS and NMOS, and that's my output there, final one. And actually this guy is connected to high there, and this guy is connected to low there. All right, so that gives me the NOT operator. So if this is A, B, C are my inputs, and say this is my Z, let me use blue. Come on, Z. Then this gives me Z equals A or B or C. So I hope uh, that discussion is helpful. Uh, now, what I want to do some interesting examples here with you guys. Uh, before I do that, this, this is simply uh, showing us what we just talked about, right? Like, how do you get AND? This is simply taking the NAND function and then uh, putting a NOT in front of it. That's how you, you would get AND. Uh, we, we already did that, so that that's fine. We can just move on here to the summary page for CMOS AND or N buffer. So for CMOS AND, how did we implement that? We connected the output of the CMOS NAND to the CMOS NOT. That's how we got the CMOS AND function, which also means that AND requires more, two more transistors than uh, a NAND operation would. So uh, right now, I'm not uh, a big fan of AND and OR operations because they are requiring more transistors. I, I'm kind of leaning towards NAND and and uh, NOR. Like these are these are, these appear pretty pretty useful to me. Uh, NAND where is NOR? Well, NOR, NOR is NOR over here, but you, the 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 same thing for uh, OR, right? So OR operation requires two more transistors than NOR. And we also talk about the CMOS buffer. The CMOS buffer can be implemented by uh, cascading two CMOS NOT gates. Okay, so oh, now I want, to, I, want, I want to go into some examples. Uh, let's say we have, uh, I want to establish a connection between logic functions that are a little bit more complicated than simply logic gate functionality, the basic ones. Uh, what if you had a logic expression? What if you have the logic expressions such as a function, a logic function f, if it was defined as say a and b or c, right? So something like that. How would I, how would I design the circuitry for this? Like how would I translate this logic expression into a transistor level circuit diagram, right? That's that's where I want to go 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 with this. So, uh, what do I have here? Well, I have and and I have a, 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 an or operation as well. Uh, a is anded with B, and the result is odd with C. That's right. But I, I need to. So you're on the right track. So I need to use some series combinations and some parallel combination, but I want to kind of expand this to, all right, what is my pull down network going to look like? What is my pull up network going to look like, right? So the whole the whole deal. Um, the one good news is if I know the pull down, then I know the pull up. And if I know the pull up, then I know the pull down, 
right? So that, that's the good news. All right, let's me, to, to go to that, let me start with this. If you notice this particular diagram here, uh, I'm talking about, I'm gonna highlight this with a, a blue circle. What do you notice about this? What is the expression at this point? Well, it's the two transistors in series. So that's my NAND operation. Um, and if I say, I, if I call this say, maybe Y is taken, A, B is there. So I'll call this Z. I'm calling this Z, A and B, yes. So what is Z? Z equals A and B. However, I, whatever I have in my pull down, right? That, that, that so far, it is direct representation of what I have over here, right? two transistors in series, that's right there. However, because it is pulled down, I also had to do a bar over the entire function. That's what gave me the NAND functionality. Now, I want you guys to look at getting to this part from the pull up network. How does that look like? Well, now you have two PMOS transistors in parallel. So how would you write the expression for Z? Well, now the other way of writing the logic expression for Z is Z equals something or something, right? Because we know when things are in parallel, you use the or operator. However, it is not going to be A or B. What is, what is wrong with that? Well, if it is A or B, how is that the same thing as A and B? They, they cannot be the same, right? But now, here is the difference. Here we had N MOS. Here, not a, you guys got it. All right. So because of that little bubble there and there, Z equals A complement or B complement. Right? And it turns out that these are exactly the same representation. That and that, they are exactly the same. And we are going to be looking at proving this. This is uh, De Morgan's law, that, that, that's what that is. Um, logically, they are the same expression. They are not unique, but, but they, are they are equivalent expressions. A and B is the same thing as not A or not B. So what does this tell me? Well, this tells me that if I know the pull down network, then I will be able to write an expression. All I need to do is invert that result, right? So let's take this and start building on, on, on this. So I, what I'll do is, uh, I'll not take this, but I'll, I'll just draw some, uh, some transistors and I will, I, and I will use the pull down network to do that, right? So I'm drawing a circuit diagram and I'm hoping that uh, we will be able to write the logic expression for this. So let's me do the pull down network first. So let me start with maybe two uh, transistors that are in parallel, uh, sorry, series. These are NMOS transistors. And then I can put another transistor that is in parallel with both of these. And then I will connect this to ground here and I have three input situation. Now I've got the pull down network. I've just sketched some arbitrary, arbitrary. Uh, oh, actually let's make it even, even, even more complicated. Uh, let's add one more. To this whole thing, let's add one more in series. How about that? So we have a four transistor situation going on. Um, and right now, uh, we, we only have the pull down network. So let me uh, name them inputs A, B, C, and D. Now, if I know the pull down network, we, we, we said that pull the pull up network is exactly going to be the opposite, right? With PMOS transistors. So if you guys call these transistors, uh, using QA, QB, QC, QD, 
how would I figure out the pull up network? Let me draw that in. Uh, well, we can do this in black. So A and B over here were in series, right? So up top, they would need to be in parallel. You guys get that? So I'm just translating A and B here to those two. Still, the input is A here and B here. The same inputs as before. Next, the parallel combination of A and B would be in series with C. You guys see that? Because over here, we had A and B that were in series. That combination was in parallel with C. Now, A and B are in parallel. That combination is going to be in series with C. All right, so what does that mean? I need to add one more transistor here. That is in series. I'm not connecting things uh, to, right now. I'm just gonna leave that over there. Uh, I can, uh, maybe I need to move this over here. All right, so I've got A, I've got B, and now I've got C as well. What do I do now? So A and B were in series, now A and B are in parallel. That combination was in C, parallel with C, now that combination is in series with C. All of that was in series with D, which means all of this would be in parallel with D, right? So one more, one more, one more. And where is the output? Well, that is the output. You guys see that? So this is my F. So. Next, the question is, what would be the logic expression for F? The, the easiest way of doing this is to look at the pull down network, write the expression and flip the entire thing, which means A and B are in series. I'm looking at the pull down network. A, oh, sorry. A and B or C, the entire thing ended with D. Not perfect. That is abs absolutely correct. Now, if I was looking at the pulled pull up network, what would I do? Well, that would be F equals. What is that? A and B are in parallel. Okay, so that is A complement or B complement. That is that those two guys are in series with C. Okay, so that is series C, all of that was in parallel with D. So all of that was in parallel with D. You see that? And these two are exactly the same expression. Well, I mean, logically the same expression. But this guy, I've used pull up network to do this. Oh, come on. So I've used the pull up network to write that and I use the pull down network to write that. All right, questions about this. I don't get why uh, why they are all complement. So because of the PMOS, right? Because of this. Because PMOS, I need to provide a low voltage to turn it on and a high voltage to turn it off. It is exactly the same, exactly the opposite of the NMOS behavior. All right, so I think I skipped over a few questions up top. Uh, let me just scroll. Uh, you guys were answering De Morgan's theorem, right, right, right. Uh, da, 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 da. Can it be above or below? Oh, uh, which one? So that so wherever you draw it, I it doesn't matter where you draw it. All that matters is the source terminals 
for the pull down network need to go to ground and the source terminals for the pull up need to be go uh, need to go to high so it doesn't matter where you where you where you put it it's just that the as long as the, the source terminals are connected to uh, the right uh, connection like ground here and plus 5 there that's all that matters uh, in pull up network could c be above oh yeah absolutely that could be above that it's in series right so it's like saying does the order of the two tran transistors over here matter well no right a is here b is here if you switch this guy over there that guy over here it doesn't matter they are in series so it doesn't really matter um, to the function uh, I see now that C times A and B what's that yeah so logical and operations are commutative it doesn't matter in which order you do them X and Y is the same as Y and X so it's kind of getting into the boolean algebra properties uh, but so until I actually go ahead and prove that take my word for it uh, where does the not come from at the pull down network part so the not over here comes from the fact that this particular network makes F go to low right so if this guy is making it go to low and you're writing the logic function for f then you need to complement that in other words you can say i'm writing the logical function for f complement and uh, for this i just need to do write that but i was not writing it for f complement i was trying to write it for f which is why i kind of complemented both sides here and here which gave me that because double complement cancels out um, when pull down network is active it pulls to ground yes do the logic expressions for the pull up and the pull down network have to be the same yes that's the only way complementary mass functions work yes you got it All right, you guys, other questions about this? Now, the, the reason why I'm spending so much time on this is because you are going to, on homework three, look at uh, an overwhelming amount of transistors in one circuit diagram. So, now that you know how to go from a circuit diagram to a logic expression, I'm hoping that this gives you uh, enough to tackle that. So don't get overwhelmed by the size of the logic, the circuit diagram. It's going to have a bunch of transistors in the pull down network. It's going to have a bunch of transistors in the pull up network. But as long as you follow how you you can you can either use the pull up version or you can use the pull up pull down version, you will get the same expression. So that's coming up on homework three. And um, in the past, people have kind of gotten uh, intimidated by the size of the circuit diagram. Now I'm hoping that with this discussion, you guys are uh, well prepared for it. It's all, it, it all comes down to observing the series and parallel combinations. That's it. All right, let's move on here. Let's come to a very, very interesting topic. And for many, uh, it has been very confusing. So, I, I'm, you know, if, I, I want you guys to be like super engaged in the discussion that is coming up. Noise margin. It is simply a subtraction. If you if you just look at the calculation aspect of noise margin, it is as simple as subtracting two values. However, it can be a little bit confusing which is why I want to go through this discussion a little bit slowly and I'm, in, I'm gonna en en encourage you guys to uh, you know uh, participate as much as you can what is noise measure what is noise margin why do I need to talk about it why do I need to quantify it what does it indicate about my logic gate 
these are all the questions that we are going to answer with this. So it is simply a measure of how much noise a logic gate can tolerate before it gives you the incorrect logic levels. So for example, if I have a situation in which, you know, my, my circuit is uh, dealing with a lot of noise, right? And I have at one point in my circuit, I have a low and because of thermal noise or circuit noise or whatever noise there could be in your system. And it, this could also come because of like fan in and fan out uh, criteria that we'll look at later on in the lecture. It could come from several different issues. But the, the thing that I'm trying to quantify is if I have a strong zero, for example, then I may be okay, right? It might be able to tolerate that noise without going into the invalid region or worse, logic one level, right? So if I'm, if I'm over here all the way down, which is the strong zero, then I'm fine. But as I get closer to this edge where I am saying that, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm at a weak, weak zero level, then I'm starting to get worried because this particular thing, if suppose it is coming from output of a logic gate and it is connected later on to an input of the following gate, then that logic level may get some noise and due to that noise, that particular weak zero might get corrupted and it might land in this invalid region. That, that, that's your noise margin. How much can it take before it gets to that invalid region? And the same thing applies for logic one, the high level. How much can it take? Well, I don't care about the strong one. I'm worried about the weak one, right? So if, if I have a weak one and I start pulling it down, I will still be able to recognize this as logic one as the input of the following gate. But if I go here or right, if I go here, then I'm in the invalid region and the, the next input is not, is the, that particular gate is going to recognize that as invalid. Uh, could noise ever corrupt a signal so badly that it becomes inverted? Oh yeah, absolutely. So here, noise, if you, if, you, if you look at noise in general, it is going to have a Gaussian distribution. What that means is it's going to have a heavy tail. So most of the time it is going, to, there is a high probability that the noise amplitude is zero or close to zero, right? So it, it, it's close to zero. The, the average of that Gaussian is going to be zero. So. 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.2, right? So closer to zero, that's the high chance. However, the farther away you go from zero on both sides, positive or negative, the chance of that happening goes down. That's your heavy tail probabilities. So sure, yeah, it would take a lot to go from zero and recognize that as a one, right? If I'm at one here and that is four, I'm going to need three volts of noise margin to, to, to do that. But sure, yeah, there is a very, very small chance, but there is a chance. Okay, so let, let us um, draw some diagrams here to kind of talk more about this concept. So why are we talking about this? We are talking about this because we are interested, at some point we will be interested in connecting the output of a logic gate, right? Let's call this logic gate one, right? And at some point we are going to have to connect it to logic gate, come on, let's do it cleaner. We will have to connect it to logic gate two, right? Whatever these may be, not, NAND, whatever that is. Uh, so if I'm connecting the output of this guy to the input of this guy, then if I say zero, it should recognize that as zero. If I say one here, it should recognize as one. However, 
the problem is if I say 0 or if I say 1 because of some noise in the middle noise contribution now this again could be thermal noise could be because of fan end could be because right now the way we have scheduled it's because of fan out it could be due to many reasons what if this zero doesn't translate to that zero what if it says oh yeah the noise was too big now i don't recognize that as a zero or i don't recognize that as a one it's invalid right now right so the question is how much noise will i be able to tolerate before this happens right so and what would you like that to be would you like the noise tolerance to be high or would you like the noise tolerance to be low high right so if if i just look at one aspect of you know things getting corrupted then you would want the noise margin to be high or the noise uh, tolerance to be high the problem is the higher you have the noise margin to be the smaller the voltage range to distinguish the zero and the one for the input side of logic gate two right so there's a trade-off there you cannot just go as high as you want you have to go you know you have to play that a little bit carefully all right let's talk more about this with this diagram right so what is what is this particular sketch describing it is describing the voltage levels that are recognized as logic one and logic zero for outputs of logic gates and it is also describing the voltage levels that are recognized as logic zero or logic one for inputs of logic gates the first thing that you notice is they are not exactly the same so the question is why are why are they not exactly the same well it is the same reason why we needed a buffer as opposed to a wire right we needed the buffer to regenerate that logic level to make it strong zero or strong one right so if it's an output of a logic gate then it is going to have a tighter boundary it is going to be more towards the strong voltage levels for both the low and the high however for the inputs it has a little bit more room so it can accept a lot bigger voltage range because it's now the input if they were the same even small uh, noise could make the signal invalid yeah yeah so if this was zero a small thing could just make it invalid you are absolutely right so noise margin the thing that is in the middle that is essentially describing how much it can take before it goes to that invalid region so let's talk uh, about the definition here and so far if you have been following the discussion the, the definition should be pretty straightforward to understand noise margin is the measure of how much noise it takes to corrupt a worst case output voltage we are talking about the weak zero or the weak one into a value that may not be recognized properly by an input of the subsequent logic gate how would a one become a zero when you have a negative wouldn't the noise add sure additive noise the value itself could be negative though right yeah absolutely noise doesn't necessarily you, you are right right so if i look at say thermal noise right Let, let's just draw maybe like a generic uh probability distribution function for say thermal noise how does it look like these are the values of noise and that is the probability i said it's going to be gaussian right so it, it essentially say, means that even that's my zero that's going to be the mean and it's going to have a shape like this uh sure uh maybe i can do better right so 
Things that are close to zero have a high probability of happening, but they can be positive or they can be negative as well. So it can be plus one or it can be minus one. Well, I'm talking about a high, high level here. It can be 0.1 or it can be negative 0.1. It could, could go either way. Um, and in fact, if you relate that to this discussion, if it is pushing it up, I'm all the way happy, right? I, I, I'm happy about that. I don't need to worry about that. I'm worried about the thing that pulls it down, right? So as you go higher in value, one, two, three, four, if four volts of noise, that is going to have a very, very, very small chance of happening. So very rarely, but it could happen. Now this could be tighter or wider depending on the characteristics of noise. All right, let's come back here. Now that's your definition. Now let's talk about uh, how do you calculate it? Well. If, I, if you wanted to calculate the noise margin, then you would have to uh, figure out what is the amplitude of this region there. For that, I need to do a subtraction. That minus this. If I do that, I will get that. Quick question. Is the noise margin for the high level, does it have to be the same as noise margin for the low level? Don't think so. Yeah, not necessarily. There's no no such requirement. You can have a different noise margin for the low level. You can have a different noise margin for the high level. But what helps me calculate this? And I, as I said, it is it comes down to doing a simple subtraction. Oh, that that's it. That that's all that that is. Simple subtraction. What helps me with this is to identify the boundaries of the low and the high levels for both the input and the output sides. So what I'll do is I will sketch some uh, markers over here. Maybe I can use uh, yellow horizontal lines to identify this guy, to identify this guy, to identify this guy, to identify this guy, identify this guy, and this guy. Some of these I don't need, some of these I do. So let's talk about what I actually need. Do I need the first one? No, I don't need the first one, right? Because that is the high logic one level. That's the maximum, right? All the way at the top. I don't need that. Like it, it, I don't really need that in my, I'm not worried about that. Like I'm not worried about the strong logic levels. I'm worried about the weak ones, right? So I need something that describes this level. What is that? Well, it is an output. It is a logic one and it is the minimum for that, right? So I'm going to describe that as a voltage limit for the output side for the high level and it is the minimum. The minimum voltage that is, uh, that falls under in the range of high for the output of a logic gate, VOH min. Similarly, I need also this guy, right? So what is that going to be? Uh, another colon zero zero. <laughs> what? V I H min. V I H min is absolutely right. Minimum voltage that is recognized as the high level on the input of the ga logic gate. Uh, all right, let's do the next one, which is what? This one. I'm interested in that. What is that going to be? V input low maximum. Good. And then the next one would be V output low maximum. You guys see that? So all I need is those boundaries. And right away, as I said, it's a subtraction, right? So how do I calculate, uh, let's say, the noise margin for the high level, which is this guy? I just need to do a subtraction. What do I need to subtract from what? 
Well, I need to do VOH min minus VIH min. You guys got it. Brilliant. Similarly, I can write my other, uh, let me use black for this, color black, done. Next, noise margin uh, low level. What is that? In this case, I'm going to have V I L max. I'm talking up uh, color code it. Alright, better. Next, V I L max minus V O L output low maximum. Right? So, as long as you figure out those boundaries, not all of them, right? You're not worried about the strong one and the strong zero, but the other four, you will just subtract and find the noise margin for the high level and for the low level. And bigger the noise margin, the better it's going to be in terms of tolerance for that noise. However, you see, if you want to increase this range, you can also push this guy down, right? You can you can push this, uh, you can you can move this V I H min or V I L max closer to each other. If you if you move them closer to each other, that noise margin goes up. But the problem is. The thing that distinguishes between logic zero and logic one is going to be a very, very, very small amount of voltage range, which is which is which is not a good news, right? You want that to be a little bit more isolated to take advantage of the fact that we are dealing with digital signals as opposed to analog signals. So again, a trade off there. Uh, but if you just look at noise margin, higher is better. If I ignore the, the thing that I talked about, how would you maximize the invalid zone? You would not maximize it, right? It is it is a um, it is an outcome of the design that you did. So it's a it's a uh, if you if you look at the the CMOS technology, we said okay, zero is zero. One point five is the highest voltage that it is in the low range, and three point five is the lowest range lowest value recognized as the high voltage so those are properties of the properties that are related to how the gate is manufactured the transistors all right we talked about this we talked about the probability now let's talk about something that is real right how can you take this discussion about noise margin and i said it's a subtraction so now hopefully you you guys are able to you know uh minimize the the kind of um confusion there could be like right? it's a simple subtraction all i need is four values i have the four values i do subtraction and i find the value right but there's an underlying concept which uh, tends to be a little bit difficult so i hopefully after that discussion it was uh, it, it, it is better now i need an inverter the first thing that i know about the inverter is if low goes in high comes out if high goes in low comes out right that's that's what i need the inverter for or that's how, that's what i need the not gate for so what i have over here is a input output transfer characteristics for a cmos inverter so I'm trying to describe as I change the voltage on the input of a logic gate, how would the output of the logic gate change? So I have input voltages marked on the X axis and output voltages marked on the Y axis. And clearly when my input voltage is very low, my output voltage is very high. Very nice. That's how I get a point here, right? So let me just uh, point that out, point here. Then as I keep increasing the input voltage from all the way low, I have high, 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 it's going pretty good. But as soon as I go over to the other region, I would get low, 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 right? 
So if my input is very high, I'm getting a low output indicated by the blue dots. And if my input is low, my output is high indicated by those pink dots. But in the middle there, in that invalid region, in that confusion region, there is a going to be a roll off between the output to the input, uh, sorry, b between the high level to the low level for the voltages. But things cannot just be either high then be low. They need to go through a high to low, but you know, it may happen in a small voltage range or it may happen in a, over a wide uh, voltage range. That depends on how you define the low and the high for a particular logic gate. So that's, that's what that is. That's describing several experiments, right? So multiple lines are shown over here to indicate that there, there have been several uh, experiment trials performed and you can average it out to get one smooth line, right? So just, instead of getting confused by multiple lines, just imagine this to be a one, one smooth line, one line. Now, when you look at, after you talk about that shape of that CMOS transfer characteristic, inverted transfer characteristic, we need to start defining some, um, some voltages. Oh, sorry. Um, we need to start defining um, input and output voltages. So if, if I have, how many values do I need? I need one, two, three, and four, right? So I need four values to, to do this. So if I need four values to do this, uh, hold on one second, you guys. Hey, sorry. hey, no problem. I'll call you later, Mason. Okay, bye. Bye. Alright, sorry about that. Let's come back. Uh, what, oh, yeah, so I need four values, right? If I have these four values, then I can do the subtraction and be able to calculate uh, high and the low and the noise margins. So, do I need all four? Or, if I know the transfer characteristic, I may be I may be able to get away with fewer than four. Do I, do I need to know all the four? What do you guys think? You have the, the you have the sketch. You, you, you have the, uh, you guys are able to hear me, right? Okay, so suppose you have you have the sketch, you have the I/O characteristic. What does that mean? For every input voltage, you know the corresponding output voltage from the NOT gate. You know that already. So the question is, do I need all those four values, or because I now know the transfer characteristics, I only need fewer than four? I think I need two. If I know two, I can find the other two. But I have to have uh, some data, some some thresholds, but I don't need to have all four. What I mean by that is this. Suppose you have some thresholds for the input voltages. And the input voltages thresholds are 3.5 volts is being recognized as the smallest voltage or the minimum voltage on the input side that is going to be considered as high, which that's described right here. A high voltage on the input side is any voltage that is greater than 3.5. So that's right there. So if you know this, what does that mean? You can, you can use the transfer characteristic, project this value on the y axis and right away you get your 0 0.8, right? You, you right away get the least voltage or sorry the highest voltage that is going to be recognized as the uh, output uh, low voltage for the, on the output side right 
And similarly, you have a boundary for the low. Anything that is lower, uh, less than 2.5 is going to be low. This is for the input. So anything that is below 2.5 is going to be considered as low. If I know 2.5, I can use the transfer characteristic, project it on the y-axis and get my four volts, right? So that's how these two values are obtained by using the two thresholds for the high and the low level on the input side and the IO characteristic to get the other points, right? So what do you guys think we should call these using our same uh, V, I, L, max, V, O, L, max, that, that nomenclature, what should we call 3.5? input high maximum or minimum minimum right so that is right here next if I take that over there, what do I get? 0 0.8, right? So what should I call this guy? V O L max. Nice. Uh, what next? Let's do this guy. 2.5, what should I call that 2.5? It's on the input side, it is for the low level. V input low level maximum. Oh, maximum, right? And then I take that 2.5, I have the IO characteristic, I get the four. So what should I call the four? V on the output for the high level, the minimum. Why would it be max and min, right? Minimum for the low is always good, right? Like I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about this. So that's the highest it can go before it goes to the invalid, right? We are talking about the low level, right? So if you are talking about the low level, you're talking about the highest it can it can register. All right, so it looks like we have the, the four values, right? So we have the OH, the, all the four values are there. We were just given this, right? We, we were just given this. We were given this. and we were able to compute the others, 0 0.8 and 4. Once you got that, you got those four values, you do the subtraction appropriately based on the, the, the formula that we talked about. So you are essentially doing 4 minus 3.5 and then doing 2.5 minus 0 0.8, you get the two values for the high and the no, low level. And clearly, there's an example where the low noise margin is much higher than the high noise margin so we are sort of tolerating more noise at the low level, much better than what we are tolerating for the high level. Questions about this example? We are going to, we are going to see a couple more variations of, of this example in a little bit. So the next thing that we are going to do is we are going to do an example here instead of having like a, a, a transfer characteristic that cannot be def, def, described using a mathematical equation, in order to keep our math simple, we can just say f f constant sl a, a, a line and constant, right? So we are trying to approximate that tra uh, transfer characteristic with something that is linear, with a, with a line, so that we can we can take one point, get the other, take the other point, get the other, and we get the four values. So 
Now the question is, if any input below 2 is considered as low and any input above 3 is considered as high, what is the noise margin for this idealized inverter? This is your inverter. You are given the two thresholds, right? Input below 2 considered low, input above 3 considered high. Where are those? Mm, let me point that out here. Da, 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 da. Right. Using red, I can say 2 somewhere here, 3 somewhere there. Right. Using 2, I can push this out project it onto the Y and I can find that out. Using 3, project it onto the Y, find that out. So to find those two values, what would I need? You, you would need the equation of the line, right? Well, slope of the line, sure. But, you know, in general, you would say slope, of, they are all related, right? So, you would need the equation of that line. What do you need for the equation of the line? You need the slope and you need the y-intercept. Or, you just need two points. All right, so are we given the two points? It looks like we are given the two points. So, let's highlight the two points here. There's one here and there's one here. What are those two points? This guy is... Uh, 1 comma 5 and this guy is 4 comma 0. So you've got the two points here that can essentially allow you to find the equation of the line and once you have the equation of the line plug in 2 and 3 for V in to find the corresponding V outs. Once you do that, you've got the four values and then you can do the subtraction and you can, you can figure all of those out, right? So that's the first question we will go through. And the second one is, can we increase the noise margin by setting a different threshold for low and high, right? So instead of two volts, can we change that to improve noise margin? Instead of three volts, can we change that to improve the noise margin? That's what we are, we are going to look at. So that's what we are doing here. That's the solution. That, that is the equation of the line, y equals mx plus b, right? So output is on the y, input is on the x, a and b are those slope and the y intercept respectively. You're trying to plug in those points, right? 1 comma 5 and uh, 4 comma 0 into those equations to find the slope and the y intercept. Pretty sure you guys can do that pretty easily. Once you do that, you plug in the 2 and the 3 into this equation for V in to find the corresponding V out, right? Those two values. They work out to be 5 over 3 and 10 over 3 respectively. And once you have these four values that I'm going to highlight in pink, you will be able to do the subtractions that are shown over here to find the high level noise margin and the low level noise margins. And in this case, it turns out that uh, you have both noise margins to be the same, 1 over 3 volts and 1 over 3 volts. So that's okay, but if, what if you wanted to increase the noise margin? What would you need to do? Can you somehow play with the thresholds 2 and 3 to make it better? Um, noise margin intuitively represents the amount of noise I can tolerate before it gets corrupted for a logic level. And that voltage or the noise margin, the, 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 the amount of voltage it can take depends on how I describe the boundaries for the high and the low levels. Once I define that for the input side, the output side boundaries are actually uh, dependent on the gate itself. Like we did, did here, right? Like once we did 2 and 3, the transfer characteristic actually helped us determine the, those uh, output voltages. Alright, so 1 over 3 and 1 over 3, right? How do I improve this? Well, I may be able to 
make this uh, 2 and 3 change to some other value, maybe that will help. For example, if I want to increase this, I can decrease that. Right? And if I want to increase that, I can uh, increase that. So, if I change this to 4 and if I change that to 1, what happens? Well, if I change that to 4 and if I change that to 1, my outputs for those values will also change. Still using the same equation on the line, by the way. But now I have a 1 volt of noise margin for both the low and the high level. So, you can improve the noise margins by setting different thresholds. Essentially, expanding that, right? So, we, we, we took this 2 to 3 and spread it over 4 to 1. The moment we did that, we were able to explore the whole region over which it was going from high to low. That helped us improve that tolerance. All right. So, higher noise margin better. Next, we'll get into the concept of fan in and fan out. What is fan in and what is fan out? Fan in is the maximum number of inputs to a logic gate. That's it. Number of inputs. Maximum number of inputs to a logic gate. So, so what, what is, is the uh, maximum fan-in, or in this case, just the fan-in, for the gate shown on the right? What is the fan-in there? Eight, right? So, so this guy has a fan-in of eight. And what is the maximum fan-in over here? Four, right? I'm looking at the worst case. So, so I have a... Fan in of 8, over here I have a fan in of 4, maximum fan in of 4, they are both representing the same thing. An 8 input CMOS NAND gate, right? An 8 input CMOS NAND gate can be synthesized by using, what, 16 CMOS transistors, 8 of them in series in the pull down network and 8 of them PMOS transistors in parallel in the pull up network. You can do that. But, but the, there is a price to pay. We'll, we'll talk, talk about, about that. that. Now, if, if you, you just look at it logically, this is one way of doing it, but there is also this way of doing it, where if you had a fan in limitation, what if you were, uh, what if the requirement was, hey, this is a NAND function, this is a NAND gate, but you can only use four inputs, the maximum uh, number of inputs you can have to this particular NAND gate is 4. If there was a limitation like that, which is called a fan in limit of 4, then you need to do some manipulation to be able to get that C8 input uh, NAND functionality, which is do a NAND here, do a NAND here, do a NOT there, and then do a NOT there. Now, you know, you, you guys might say, all right, is this the same as this? Well, you, you are going to learn later on a little bit more advanced techniques to prove this, but in short, think of it like this. This knot cancels out with this knot. So this is this or this. It is doing NAND here for four inputs here, NAND here for four inputs there. So it is also the same thing as eight input NAND. So which one is better? Left or the right? This is left, this is right. The left is better, right is better, left is better. <laughs> all right, so you guys are both right. You're all right. The reason is this. Left is better, right uses fewer transistors. And more importantly, the right has lesser propagation delay, right? So there is always this trade-off between fan in limitation and propagation delay through a logic circuit or a circuit diagram. So for this guy, the fan in limitation is four, 
which is good, and we'll talk about why that is good in just a minute when we look at the details of fan in and fan out. But the over here, I have a problem. A high fan in could lead to a problem in terms of voltage ranges for specific scenarios. Again, we'll talk about that. So the problem with the left guy is, let me write that in red. A uh, higher propagation delay, propagation delay, and that is also like more gates and all that. And on the right, you have a uh, higher fan in. Again, a trade off. Uh, isn't left buffered? Uh, there is no buffer over there. there. I, I would I would call this an alternate way of synthesizing an eight uh, input, input NAND function, but we are doing this with circuits that are using lower fan in, which is going to be beneficial, and we will talk about that. Uh, left has greater noise margin, right is less transistors. Less transistors is fine, but you know. Propagation delay is less. That that's what is the the the, the outcome of that. Uh, it's going through many levels, right? If you look at this as one level, this as the second level, this as the third level, it's going to multiple layers, one level after the other. This is happening at the same time. Then that, then that. So it's a three-level circuit with a maximum fan in of four. One-level circuit with a maximum fan in of eight. So in terms of fan in limitation. This, this is bad. bad. However, in terms of propagation delay, this is bad. So it's a trade-off, right? So depends on what the user is shooting for. All right. So this is why we need to talk about that because there is propagation delay involved in circuits. The moment you change an input, right? So for example, if you have Z as the output of an R function, X and Y are the inputs of the R function. If you change X, it takes some time to change Z. So you see this? If you change X, for example, you change X over here from low to high, Z changes a little bit later than that because for the signal to propagate through the logic gate, it's also called the gate delay, right? So it's a gate delay. So when you look at just one gate, you're talking about the gate delay. When you look at a total like a complete logic diagram, then you're looking at propagation delay through the complete circuit diagram. This one is kind of like the same because it's the simple gate operation X or Y. So when you change the input, output changes after some time. In some situations, that might be okay. In some other situations, for example, high-speed applications, that might not be okay. Uh, so, and in some, in some scenarios, you actually can take advantage of propagation delay. It helps you design some more advanced logic circuits, um, i.e. sequential circuits, latches and flip-flops and whatnot. So propagation delay, it actually helps us do some advanced stuff, but for now we are going to treat this as a negative, right? It's, it's taking, it's, it's going to be limiting, it's going to be constraining to the high-speed applications. Uh, all right, so is it measured that? Yeah, absolutely, very small. So, so it depends, depends on, on how you're going to use propagation delay. delay. In, in some, in some, some scenarios, in actually, actually in, in the design of latches, you want propagation delay to exist. And you, because you're going to leverage that to make memory out of circuits. So, so, so it, it, you know, it, it's, it's kind of good and bad, bad at the same time. time. For some applications, it's good, some applications, it's not. But, but no matter, no matter what, what it is, this is what it is. It's, it's going, going to take, take some time for the input change to cause the output to change. Right? So Z is, why is changing over here? Take some time for Z to change. Why is changing over here again? Take some time for Z to change. So that's propagation delay, or if you're just looking at down to the gate level, it's called the gate delay. So we said there's a trade-off between fan in and propagation delay. That's what that meant. All right. So we have been talking about fan in. Let's go deep into it, right? Uh, maybe I can um, I can have a preliminary discussion in terms of fan in. What happens when I add resistors in series? 
R R R R. What happens when you have resistors in series? They add up, right? So you get what? Four R. R E Q equals four R, right? Uh, how, how about, about the voltage? voltage? If, if this was some part of the circuit and you were applying certain voltage to this, in one scenario you had R and in the other scenario you had four times R, would the voltage across the entire series combinations increase, decrease, stay the same? Oh, no, no, no. Across the whole thing, from here to here. So in, so in one, one scenario, scenario, you have one R between, between that, that point and that point. point. And, and in the, the other scenario, scenario, same two points, points but, but now you have five R or four R, R whatever. whatever. So, so R now is four R, which means that based on your voltage division rule, right? Voltage, voltage is proportional to the resistance. resistance. So, so the, that's, that's the ratio it gets divided in. It's directly proportional to the resistance. So if the resistance of one of the components goes up, the voltage associated with that goes up, right? But voltage going up may not be such a good idea as far as voltage ranges are concerned because voltage ranges are tied to my logic levels, low and high. So if I'm increasing this without paying attention to how much it is increasing, I may end up in trouble. In the same manner, I can, you know, do the other situation. What happens if you have resistors in parallel? R, 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 R in parallel. What is the equivalent resistance? Oh, R, R over 4, done. Same value, R, right? So it gets divided by 4, right? So, so what, what happened, happened here? here? The, the resistance went down, which means the voltage across that would go down, which might not be a good situation because, again, voltage ranges are associated with logic levels. You guys see that? So a high voltage might accidentally become low in this situation. A low voltage might actually become high in this situation. You guys see that? So, series, resistors, <laughs> so, so what's the confusion here? here? All right, so, so let, let me, let me, let me draw a, 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 a different diagram. diagram. Uh, I, have I have a voltage, voltage source, plus minus five volts, I have two resistors, right? Uh, this, this guy is say one kilo ohm, this guy is one kilo ohm, right? And, and I'm measuring across this guy. guy. What, what am I, I going, going to measure, measure here? 2.5. Brilliant. Now, instead of 1K and 1K, I want to maybe change this to 5K. What happens then? Does this remain at 2.5 or it changes? Does it go up or down? Is it higher, right? Much higher. So, when I have multiple things connected, to something, uh, to a certain point, I have multiple things that are connected in series, their overall resistance will go up, which will actually make that voltage go up. If the voltage goes up, and if you want, if you were expecting something to be low, but things, because they added up resistance, it went high, right? Smaller quantities that add up, Right? Point, point, one, point, one, point, one, point, one, point, one, point, one. Well, overall, it, it is now point five, right? So, when you start adding up smaller quantities, because you are adding, you will inevitably, inevitably become, uh, you, you will accumulate. And then as you accumulate, these are voltage levels. So, that means that if you did low, 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 because you are doing multiple of them and you are accumulating, you might end up in the invalid region. You guys see that? So, so that's, that's the problem based on combining more inputs to a logic gate. Uh, and in fact, the same thing happens when you do more outputs to a logic gate. Voltage division, series and parallel. In series, things are going to go up. In parallel, resistance is going to go down, so the voltage goes down. All right, so let's talk about that over here. 
we have two NAND gates in this diagram. The left one is two input NAND gate. The right one is five input NAND gate. Let me just write it down over here. Two input situation is right there and a five input situation is right there. And we know that for a NAND gate, we need the um, pull down network to be switches in series, the pull up network to be switches in parallel. And for the pull, so the same thing applies for, you know, this guy as well. So this is my pull down network. This is, this is my pull up network. So for NAND, two input situation, two N mass transistors in series, two P mass transistors in parallel. And when you go for the five input case, what do you have? Five in parallel, five in series in the pull down, right? So now if you start looking at these situations that are described on the left, you will see the impact of having more inputs to a gate. So two input NAND gate, both inputs are high. Well, what happens when both inputs are high? You have low resistance for this guy, low resistance for this guy, right? Why? Because these switches are closed. When the switch is closed, it is having, well, ideally zero resistance, but realistically a low resistance. So when you have two things that are low, say 0.1 and 0.1, and they are adding up in series, that voltage across that series combination might be low enough to register as low. Right? That, that's what we want. When the two inputs are of a NAND gate are high, we want that output to be low. That's NAND functionality. And if there are two of them, sure, that might be okay. But now when you have five of them in series and all the inputs are high, what happens? You are accumulating them one after the other, which means they might get added up in series, pushing that V out into the invalid zone or the, uh, so basically the output is now floating. Well, not floating, it is still connected to this, right? It's not floating, but it is now measuring a value that may not be registered by the subsequent logic gate as low. All inputs are high, so the output of the five input NAND gate should be low. Same thing as two input, should be low. but over here, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, when you added up 0 0.2, sure, no problem. But when you added 0 0.1 five times, it became 0 0.5. Now you're getting close to that weak zero region, right? So V out is too high. You guys see that? So that puts a limitation on how many number of inputs you can add. So in the example that we saw earlier, about eight as our fan in, that could have been a problem, right? Because that would mean that you are adding eight resistors in series here. It is, it is only a problem for the NAND when inputs are high, right? So it's not going to be a problem when inputs are low, right? This becomes a problem when input is high. But it is going to be a problem. I need to cover for this, which, which is why I need to have a fan in limitation. Typically, four is kind of a realistic value to start at. Questions about fan in limitation for any gate. Like why do we need it? Where is it coming from? All right, now there is a fan in limitation. There is also a fan out limitation. What does fan out limitation mean? Well, if you have a particular logic gate, so for example, if you have a logic gate one here, maybe you want to connect the output of the logic gate to four things, right? So the fan out is right now four. But the question is, is that going to work? Is that not going to work? Meaning, if this is a one over here, will all these guys register it as a logic one or will they register it as an invalid or worse, they register it as zero, right? I don't know. I am adding a lot of things in parallel. Okay, when you add things in parallel, you will reduce the resistance, overall resistance, which also means that the voltage level drops proportionately 
yes, yes that, that could be a problem, problem right? right? So that, that's, that's where we are going with this. So the, the final implementation for a NAND gate, gate again, we are using the same NAND gate as an example. example. When you have, again, you have the two input case here, and you have the five, sorry, here you have the uh, two input NAND gate situation here, and over here you have two input that is connected to five things. So, two inputs, uh, let me do this. Two inputs, right? In this case, there are two inputs. Again, this is also a two input, but it is connected to five things over here. Which means that in one situation, I just have a NAND gate not connected to anything. In the other situation, I have NAND gate, two input NAND gate, that is connected to five things. When you connect things like five, you are essentially, in terms of a circuit, you are essentially putting more and more resistors in parallel. So now what happens when the inputs are high? Well, when the inputs are high, uh, sorry, when the inputs are low, the NMOS transistors are going to be open, right? Which means that they're going to have a high resistance here and a high resistance here. So the V out that is associated with those two is going to be high enough, which is what we expect. That's good news. When, when the inputs, inputs are low, the output of an NAND gate should be high. high. So that's, that's good. good. However, for the same gate, you add five things at the output, what happens? Again, you have the inputs as low. So you have low here, low here. So you have a, at this particular point, the V out is high enough, but now because you are adding a lot of resistors in parallel, your overall resistance goes down, V out might be low. It might be too low to recognize as high. Uh, I think I had this issue when adding eight LEDs to the output of the logic circuit and it wasn't working until I added a series. Uh, so when you add a series resistor, you are essentially saying that uh, please allow my voltage to split between that LED and the resistor. So even if you go high in terms of your a voltage that you supply to the LED, it kind of breaks up into two pieces, right? The resistor is there essentially to protect your LED. And it's also there to, you know, limit the current through the LED for other purposes. Um, but if you had the voltage source to be very small, so suppose I was using the red LED and I connected it to a two volt supply, that would work properly. But if I connected it to five, six, seven, maybe nine, it will pop. So, so I, I need that resistor in series with the LED to kind of protect it. 220 ohms is typically what you use. Uh, that is kind of standard. 220 ohms or 470 ohms. That's what you use in series with the, the LEDs. All right. So let's see. That's your final and final limitation, you guys. Uh, one is controlling the amount of inputs you can have to a gate. The other is limiting the amount of things you can connect to the output of a logic gate. All right. Uh, questions? I think we, we so, so th this com essentially completes our discussion on digital circuits. The next time we meet on Friday, uh, I will be talking about Boolean algebra properties. I'm going to be so Boolean algebra tends to be a little bit boring uh, for uh, for many students, but I'm going to try my best to put some uh, put some interesting twists to Boolean algebra properties. So that's what we will be doing on Friday. Uh, let me stop recording here. I will be taking questions now.